presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, what do the Jews, the Greeks, and the Irish all have in common? A conversation with best-selling author Thomas Cahill, next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. A welcome as well to those of you listening on NPR News 91 and the World Wide Web. Tonight we bring you one of a series of conversations conducted at the 2005 Sun Valley Writers Conference. Since 1995, the conference has brought together some of the nation's best known writers, poets, filmmakers, and philosophers to engage an audience in provocative and thoughtful conversations. One of those writers is Thomas Cahill. The author of eight books, Cahill is the former director of religious publishing at Doubleday and has taught at several universities. He's most well known for his series, The Hinges of History, which chronicles important transitional moments in Western civilization. He's currently working on the fifth book in that series. First of all, welcome to Idaho. Thanks so much, Marsha. It's nice to have you here. I want to talk about your series, first the title of it, Hinges of History. What I wanted to get the idea across was that, that uh, we're showing transitions, how we got from one thing to another. So these are these really are hinges. That's what 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 the books are. They, sh or you could say bridges. That would be another uh, way of saying it. But how we got from one place to another uh, in the course of Western history. I think that historians, academic historians, uh, deal with less and less territory all the time. Um, you know, an individual academic historian will be an expert on perhaps 50 years of history, maybe 100, if he's really broad. Uh, and that doesn't always give us the transition. It doesn't always tell us, because transitions sometimes take place over a thousand years. You're too, far too young to remember the old Walt Disney nature movies that showed in, uh, on Saturday mornings when I was a kid. And one of the things they always did was they showed you in time-lapse photography um, a bud opening into a flower. Well, that's what I want to do. It's really all these books are time-lapse photography. I, I want to show you the movement. I don't want to just say, well, now we're in the 19th century and we turn the page and now we're in the 20th century. In the year 1970, I first thought of this series. And in my mind then, it was six books. And then I thought, no, this series needs a simpler introduction, uh, something that helps me gather an audience. And that's when I thought of How the Irish Saved Civilization, which is a kind of introductory volume to the whole series. It takes place about halfway through Western history, uh, at the end of the classical period and the beginning of the medieval period. We should say the first book didn't end up being on, the, on Jews, it ended up being on the Irish. Right, and then volume two is The Gifts of the Jews, the Jews are the, the foundation stone of Western history. There is no West before the Jews. So in volume two, we go back to the very beginning, and then we begin slowly to come forward. The name of the book is How the Irish Saved Civilization. Now, <laughs> it, was that kind of tongue-in-cheek, or did you really well, they did. it that way? They really did. It, 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 it's a kind of, it sounds like terrible braggadocio. Um, I remember when it was first being... Um, solicited by the Doubleday uh, sales force, they told me that they were selling it as a blank book. <laughs> so, <laughs> just to tease <laughs> To make me. fun of. Right. Um, it, you know, it sounds ridiculous. And yet, it is true. There was this moment when literacy almost came to a halt in the West under the force of the barbarian invasions. Uh, civilization, as we knew it, was about to collapse because the library of the West was about to be lost. The library of Greco-Roman and Ju Judeo-Christian civilization, everything that we had up to that point. Um, if there was no one to read, there were not going to be any books that would survive. And of course, in those days, 
Uh, there were no printing presses. You, if you wanted a book, you had to copy it out by hand from some master somewhere. And uh, uh, luckily, the Irish, <coughs> who were very simple people, very simple barbarian people, had just learned to read and write. And they thought that this was fantastic. They thought the alphabet was great fun. And they took up the great task of copying out the whole of the Western Library. Otherwise, we, we would certainly have lost maybe all of Latin literature, much of Greek literature that we still possess. <clears throat> uh, Hebrew literature would have been saved by small groups of Jews here and there, but, they, but, but the, the sense of the West would have been lost. So in a sense, they helped save Western civilization, because I know some people have written in and said, wait a minute, there, there were other civilizations. Yeah, but this is our civilization. This is the one that we started with. For us, this is civilization. It's not as if you can wake up in the morning and say, well, I think I'm going to change my civilization. You can't really do that. So for us, they save civilization. One of the things that you've talked about is that you're also trying to chronicle the great gift givers that we've had in our civilization, and that when you write these books, you come across people that you hadn't expected to come across. And in the Irish book, that was St. Patrick, or Patricius, yeah. as he was known growing up. Well, that's what his mother would have called him. Right, because he was actually a Brit Briton, but a, he uh, was he, Roman. Yeah, he was a Roman citizen of the island of Britain. And I didn't know until I read your book that he actually was enslaved. Yeah. As, a, as a young man. By the Irish. By the Irish. By the crazy Irish. So what kind of things did you learn about St. Patrick, Patricius? Well, you know, Patrick <coughs> left us um, an autobiography. It's, it's quite brief, but it's called The Confession. It doesn't mean a confession in our modern sense. It means uh, a testimony, really, is probably would be a better translation of the, of the Latin confessio. And it, it's a testimony to his life. It's, it's what happened to him. Um, but Patrick was a very unusual guy. He was a tough little nut. He had tremendous courage, tremendous generosity. And he really impressed the Irish, who were not easy to impress except by those qualities, because they were extremely courageous themselves uh, to the point of foolhardiness. So this is, he brought. Christianity, but he also built it on the kind of people that the Irish were. Instead of giving them, and he didn't try to make them into Athenians. Uh, he didn't try to make them into Greco-Romans, which would have been impossible. So he built on the qualities that they already had. And one of those qualities was a kind of earthy mysticism. Uh, they believed that the world... Shape-shifting. Yeah, but they believed that the world was full of magic and full of signs. And he used that. Uh, he also, they were also people who really admired sacrifice. They, in fact, m made human sacrifices, which he got them to stop. And he said, no, all of this is no longer necessary because Christ died for all, and you don't have to do this anymore. But they were very impressed by the story of, uh, uh, in the Gospels of Jesus. Um, and it was at this very basic, simple level that all of this got underway. How did he spread Christianity? Obviously, there was no internet or no, no. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and not Mass only that, media. there were no cities in Ireland. He had a hard job. He was there for 30 years. Um, just walking. Just walking. Walking. You bet. Uh, I doubt he ever even had a horse. Based on what you uh, know about Ireland, are you uh, coming up to modern times? Are you hopeful about the? the latest uh, announcements coming out of Ireland about potential peace? Well, I'll be honest with you. I despise the IRA uh, and uh, think that they are continuing to play games. Uh, so is the other side. But uh, it will be a long time before the poisons that are still in that society are drained away. Just as an aside, as a historian, looking back at at the Irish and how they transcribed everything and, and, and saved these texts, you know, a historian looking back on this period is either going to be, I would assume, deluged with material, or conversely, 
uh, the written word is, is going away, the, the actual transcriptions, letters, because people are using the computer. Yeah, but they are, they're, they're putting words into the computer. Um, and uh, I would say that every year we have more documentation than we ever had before. Um, as I get closer to the present, the books are taking me longer to write. The book that I'm writing right now is on the high Middle Ages, and there are far more documents than I've... You know, if you go back to the ancient Jews or the ancient Greeks, there are only so many primary documents. Once you reach the Middle Ages, it begins to open up. There's a figure in the book that I'm writing right now, Hildegard of Bingen, who's one of the great feminist figures of the 12th century. And um, she was an abbess. Well, she left behind three volumes of letters. Nice. <laughs> now, you can't find, Moses didn't do that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's no, so uh, the, it, when you think about things like that, you realize that the, the documentation element increases as time goes on. Speaking of Moses, let's uh, move on to the gift of the Jews. Um, you've said that before the Jews, there was no West. Yeah. What do you mean by that? The Jews are the grandmothers and grandfathers of the Western world. Um, they are the ones who first came up with the fundamental ideas that create Western sensibility. Um, when Abraham uh, sets out for the unknown, the idea of time changes. Before that, in all societies, time was cyclical. It recurred. People didn't think the way we do about time. They didn't think that what would happen in the future would be something different, something unknown. They thought, no, no, it will be the same as what happened in the past. In fact, they looked up at the sky, and they thought that what they saw there in the zodiac was predictive of what would happen on Earth. So things just keep coming back again. And what was will be again. And with Abraham, you have the first story, sort of the first story in which nobody knows exactly how it's going to end till it ends. Um, so they gave us the sense of the future. Yes. An time in our inter sense. Intergenerational and, progress. Yeah, and that the future, the only thing that's real about the future is that it hasn't happened yet. Not that it can be predicted. Uh, also, Abraham is um, an individual as nobody in ancient literature ha has been an individual up to him um, because he has an individual destiny that no one else has. It's his. It belongs to Abraham. And that's the beginning of the idea of individual destiny and the idea of individuality. You also mentioned that you believe that uh, Jews introduced the idea of justice to all. Yeah, and I also said that we are not very good at that one. We're very good at time and we're very good at individuality. We've got that down you know, really well. Um, both uh, Christians and Jews are, have yet to embrace the notion of justice, which doesn't come to fruition in Abraham. It really comes to fruition uh, first in the Ten Commandments and then in the, um, the rantings of the prophets who keep saying to the Jewish people, no, you're not doing it right. What's important is taking care of the poor. Uh, God doesn't care how many prayers you send up to him. Are the poor taken care of? You say that there, it would be nice to have a modern day prophet, someone who could singe our eyebrows a little bit. <laughs> you don't see anyone on our current horizon. No, we do. That, we have that, some. We could use a few more. Dalai Lama, who, who do you think would be considered a modern day prophet in, in the sense? Well, they may not all have the stature of someone like Jeremiah, but I think um, uh, Desmond Tutu in South Africa, um, Helen Prejean, the death row nun. And we should say that your definition of, or when you talk about prophets, it's not people who can just you know, predict the future or whatever. No. It's the people who give us, show us the present. Who show us what is wrong with what we're doing right now. Um, who say, no, 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 you can't get away with this. I, I, honestly, I think that someone like Sandy Sheehan sitting outside um, Mr. Bush's ranch in uh, Texas is prophetic. She's a prophetic figure. The person that you met in this book, similar to meeting St. Patrick in the Irish book, was David. Yeah. 
well, he's my favorite. He's the one that I really liked. That <clears throat> David, whereas Abraham and Moses um, are truly ancient people, you know, and, the, and in that way, they're, there's something, they're almost surrounded by mist, you know, no matter how you try to get close to them, you the can't, fog machine. <laughs> you can't quite penetrate all of that mist. David just seems like, you know, I said he's, the, he could have been the captain of the football team or the, you know, he was a, he was extremely entertaining. He was a, he was a wonderful politician. Uh, left us some, left us some psalms. Yeah. Well, he was also an absolutely terrific poet. You know, and I, he was a great sinner and a great poet, which is a wonderful combination. Now, you encourage people to, to, to read the Bible as, as slowly as they need to, and you even learn some Hebrew as well to help you uh, understand it. Well, in each of the books, I've tried to approach the, the, the important original language, whatever it was, and it seemed to me essential to learn Hebrew. Um, and you, you know Greek? as well, which helped you for the book on the Greeks and the book on Jesus? Yes, because the New Testament is written in Greek. Um, and um, I, I, luckily, I didn't have to learn Irish uh, because the major texts were in Latin, and, which I did already know. Um, and so the, back to the Hebrew, it helped you? Oh, it was tremendously important, I think, because every language, you can translate from one language to another. But each language is almost like um, like a musical instrument. You know, you can play the same tune on a piano that you play on a cello, but they sound completely different. They give you a different feeling, and um, e each language has its own uh, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Hebrew is really a desert language to begin with, and it um, very spare. Yeah, it, 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 it's under tension. And um, in Hebrew, nobody says more than they have to say. Um, Lech lecha. Yeah. Uh, Go out. Uh, it, it, it's, it's um, it, no one uses three words if two will do. And if they can use silence, they'll use silence. You know, in the desert, in a place like Sinai, even today, the people who live there, they move very slowly. They think before they speak. And I think the ancient Hebrews were very much like that. So listen, to, listen so to speak, to the silences in the Bible as well. Uh, they're very important. What isn't there, or what doesn't seem to be there, is very important. You have been accused by some of liking Jews too much, <laughs> admiring them too much. Is this the book that brought the most of that sentiment down uh, on you? I mean, how do you, how do you respond to that? You've always been fascinated by the Jewish culture, uh -huh. you're Catholic, I should say. Um, so how do you respond to the people who, who say that about your work? I, I, don't, I, I, I can be critical of Jews, but um, as I can of all the people that I deal with. But um, what I said to begin with is simply true. They are the grandmothers and grandfathers of the Western world. To, and I think we must honor and, and give homage to our ancestors. If we don't know who our ancestors are, we're orphans without a past, without a history. And then we don't really know who we are. We're rapidly running out of time, which is unfortunate, but I want to touch on some of your other books. The Greeks, uh, you, you wrote a book, Why Greeks Matter. Um, you see parallels in America's current situation to what happened in Greece and in ancient Rome. The, uh, I, I see some, yes. Not, of course, there are many differences. History never repeats itself. That's the one thing it never does. But we still see things that are very useful lessons to us. And uh, the loss of the Athenian Empire, uh, which was very gradual and surprising to the Athenians, reminds me of the situation that America is in right now. I think that we've gone foolishly and thoughtlessly into a needless war, as the Athenians did against the Spartans. They finally ended up losing, which Athens never thought possible, but they went in without allies. They thought they were so terrific that they didn't need allies. And that's finally what their, their own sense of superiority did the men. And I think that very often happens in history. The people whom everybody says are sure winners, 
don't end up winning. You wrote a book about the people around Jesus. You've called Jesus the single most interesting and influential figure in the history of the Western world. Uh, tell us more. Well, he's hard to get away from. Uh, Jesus, you know, even when nobody talks about him, seems to be there in some sense. He's, even if he's a figure of humor, uh, as he is, say, with someone like Monty Python or something like that, he's still, the, he's still there. He can't, he, in many ways, he does sum up for the West the Jewish prophetic tradition. He does, he says again and again. Well, he's a Jew. He's a Jew, and he said, but he speaks as a prophet. Um, you must do this, you mustn't do that. Again and again he's saying, you must treat people with compassion. Everyone deserves compassion. These are, are words that none of us can ever quite get around. You've said that reading him in the Greek helps see some of his humor. That's, that's, that's so much of what we hear in Jesus' words that's been translated into English makes him sound rather stuffy and kind of with a halo around, around him all the time. Yeah. To read him in the Greek brings out a different side <clears throat> of Jesus. Well, he's, he is humorous. He, he makes jokes, <laughs> which you almost never know. And, you know, I think this is true not just in the New Testament, but the whole of the Bible. Translators of the Bible get attacks of reverence. You know, they feel, they think, well, uh, I see what the Hebrew says or I see what the Greek says, but we Nobody's gonna, we can't say this in a synagogue or a church. So they kind of finesse it. And some of it is, uh, some of it is rough. Some of it is um, vulgar. And you'd be surprised how and much of that there are, is. Some are not even translated correctly into English because yes. they're rather vulgar. Um, the person that you met in this journey was Paul. Yeah. Well, he was the one who surprised me because I never liked Paul at all. <laughs> And then I, I realized, first of all, I had to separate out what he wrote from what he really didn't write, even though it's attributed to him. And already then you get a completely new picture of him. Because a lot of the things that he's been accused of are in the letters that we now know he didn't write, that were written in his name after his death. Being, uh, being against women. And yeah. He was really... A, a, a feminist. Yeah. I mean, he was, a, he was an egalitarian. I think why I didn't like Paul and why a lot of people don't like him is he's a man who's so on fire with what he wants to say that he can be annoying. He can rub you the wrong way. He's not someone who ever calmed down, who ever took it easy, who ever just said, well, let's have another drink. <laughs> that was never, well, he said what he, he would, said was, he, let's set off to the next town. He said he was a man <laughs> born out of time, yeah. and he never got to meet Jesus. Right. So maybe he felt that extra push, push to, uh, to, to evangelize. But he's incredibly interesting psychologically, I think. Your main question about Jesus was, has he had an effect? Looking around us today, uh, has he had? I think so, but it, it, you could say yes and no. That's the answer. The Western, you know, history never goes in a straight line. It it's always goes in zigzags. It, we know now that it doesn't go in a circle, but it also doesn't go in a straight line. It's up and down and in and out and around and back and... You know, sometimes there are regressions and sometimes there are forward movements. But overall, I think that we are, in the West, in a better position than we once were. We, for instance, don't, for instance, don't go to war with one another. Um, Protestants and Catholics stop shooting at one another with the advent of the Enlightenment in the late 17th, early 18th century. That was a very, very important step. Um, the horrors of the Holocaust in the 20th century, I think, have created, however horribly, uh, a, a, a whole new consciousness. That doesn't mean that we're going to prevent all future genocides, because th th there are ones occurring right now that we're not doing anything about. But no one talks the way they used to talk about such things. Seems to me what you were saying about uh, we've moved past Christians attacking each other. Islam, people f may for forget or not know, is still a newer religion. In, in, Seven in, centuries younger than Christianity. In comparison to Christianity. So what Do you know where we would be right now if, if Christianity were seven centuries younger? We'd be back in the 13th century, where no one had thought of the idea of tolerance. It hadn't even been broached. So perhaps we're seeing a transition right now in Islam, a hinge, so to speak, where they're trying to figure out 
where they are, especially with different branches of Islam. By the end of the 17th century, uh, intelligent Catholics and Protestants said, why do we have to keep shooting at one another? And, and that's it's out of those questions that the Enlightenment really ar arises. Um, the, unfortunately, in Islam, uh, Sunnis and uh, Shiites have not yet said to themselves, why do we have to stop shooting at one another? So perhaps a, a peacemaker is needed for yeah. Islam. How many centuries from now do we need to be able to look back on where we are right now and say, like, are we in a hinge of history right now or in a transition period? Um, can we even know ourselves right now? Uh, only to an extent. We can't go into the future. I, I think one of the things that the ancient Jews taught us is that what is real, real about the future is that it hasn't happened yet. And therefore, we cannot really pitch ourselves forward into the future. You know, virtually every uh, futuristic novel that's ever been written has proved to be false by the time. Look at 1984. 1984 yeah. When we got to 1984, <laughs> we weren't there, were we, or anywhere near it. The best we can do is to be prophetic or to listen to prophets who tell us what's actually happening right now, which could have wonderful or terrible impact on the future. It's a lot easier to look at the past than to look at the present. You do say that it's important for everyone to remember that we all share the same feelings with humans in the past. We may not look like them, we may not even think like them. The human body hasn't really changed. We still weep when we are sad, we still laugh when we're happy, you know, we still dance. We have all those human emotional reactions that they did. So that you can go back into, you can go back 5,000 years and, and still find a pretty good joke back there, you know? You can find a poem that may be that old, but that you actually can relate to, that tells you something human. And you say, ah, now I understand. Well, thank you for helping bring some of those people to life for us. Appreciate your time, and again, welcome to Idaho. Thank you, Marcia. You've been listening to author Thomas Cahill, one of a series of conversations from the Sun Valley Writers Conference. You can listen to this interview again and the others in the series by going to our website, idahoptv.org slash dialogue. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you'll join us same time next week. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. To order a copy of this program from Idaho Public Television, call our toll-free number or visit us on the World Wide Web.